But the idea was smart contracts to have a reproducible code running on the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that so you could probably, you could probably use that. Uh, so you're saying so you're yeah. so yeah. so just like a like uh, this. Since we don't have class next week, uh, I'm going to lecture on the first four chapters you have assigned on the Mythical Man Monthly. Uh, and I'll talk at the end of that about things that you need to get done over the next couple of weeks. When I'm done with that, I've, I've, I've had several questions. Let, 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 me, let me clarify some things. Because we have roughly 60 students here, uh, it would be useful to narrow down the scope of project ideas sooner rather than later. <coughs> One of the things that I think I will do after the end of this lecture is give everyone a chance, or give, give anyone a chance, I won't say everyone. If any of you have ideas that you're interested in, Raise your hand. No, 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 not that. <laughs> At the end of the lecture, sorry. You got me all excited there. I, I know. At the end of the lecture, what I'll do is I'll ask you to raise your hand, put out your idea, and I'll ask who else is interested in that. That will do us some pre-screening. If you raised your hand in class today and you didn't get enough response, you can count yourself as having proposed an idea. <laughs> And we'll try to get this narrowed down to a more reasonable number of ideas to vote on uh, so that those of you who have ideas, I mean, you can still propose ideas. You don't have to propose it here in class. You can still put it up on the wiki. You can still wait and see who votes on it and so on. But uh, if you want to get an initial sense of interest, you can do that. And as, as I've told a few of you, I think, I'm trying to think if I said this generally or just privately to a few of you, if there is an idea proposed on the wiki that is an idea you're already interested in, submit that as your idea. Just say, I'm also, you know, just basically mark yourself off as having done that and this is my idea. Uh, in the uh, billable hours thing, you can say, put the, put the name of the idea. So multiple of you can all get credit for coming with an idea that you're all just sharing. Now it's sort of a easy way out, but you know, like I said, we've got 60 people here. Uh, I'm not looking forward to the number of voting rounds we'd have to do with 60 ideas. Uh, so let's talk about the Mythical Man Month. Fred Brooks. I've, I've been in software engineering for 44 years. I've written a lot. Articles, books, I've lectured, I've testified before Congress, yada, yada, yada. Every time I think I have learned something new, about software engineering, I'll go back and, and sure enough, there's a sentence in there somewhere for Fred, where Fred Brooks references it. It's hard to overstate how important this book is and how much it is neglected. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the, this is based on his experience, and, and part of it is just Fred Brooks is very brilliant. But he was... Uh, oversaw the development of OS 360 for the IBM 360. It was basically based on experiences in the 1960s. And as I said, the, it remains a classic <coughs> because it does set forth these issues. Software failure is a big deal financially. You see estimates all over the place, but $100 billion a year is probably a good solid estimate for money lost on failed IT projects. Uh, the biggest single project I know of was over in England, they had a software project to completely revamp the software used through their whole nationwide welfare system. They spent 16 billion pounds. So you're now looking at 20 plus billion dollars, and they abandoned it. They had no useful software come out of it. Okay. That's sort of at the extreme end, but there are lots and lots of abandoned or failed projects. <coughs> I testified before Congress three times. My standard line on that is it just goes to show any damn fool can testify before Congress, and a lot of us do. <laughs> uh, but this was over the need to carefully manage IT projects. And I said, the Mythical Man Month is often regarded as the Bible of information technology because it is universally known. How many of you had heard of the Mythical Man Month before coming in here? 
you know, your undergrad students, okay? Get out in industry and mention, so oh, yeah, mythical mammoth. Often quoted, occasionally read, and rarely heeded. That's what you'll find. I had a project I was called in to help get back on track, and with permission of the uh, division chief, I bought 32 copies of Mythical Man Month and literally gave it to everyone involved, from the division chief down, through all the managers, all the programmers, everyone. I checked back six to eight weeks later, not a single person had read it, even though this is part of getting the project back on track. That's why I say, if you do your reading in this work, you will go out into industry knowing more about the causes of IT success and failure than most of the people you work with. Brooks has first chapter is called The Tar Pit, where he's talking about why does software go bad? Uh, you're all going to read this, so I'm not going to go into this in great detail. Complexity and levels of types of software. You know, what's What's the difference between developing a program for yourself and developing a development environment for someone else to develop commercial programs for? You have a you have vast range of complexity between those two ends. Uh, what is it, based on your own experience to date, that makes software hard to maintain and update? Keep working functionally. It just as it gets bigger, it gets really hard to like organize and like like it just gets so complex that it's really just and as it gets bigger, it just gets harder and harder to deal with. Yep. In like every aspect. As you go along, the architecture changes a lot, and then you get a lot of mismatch pieces that become hard to maintain. Good point. Yeah. It's not for knowledge. Easier to write than to read. <laughs> Yes, and, and let me tell you right now, as someone who has worked in the industry for decades, a lot of your career will end up be reading other people's software and often swearing at them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. The needs can also change depending yes. on the parts. Time just seems to get more, t things become more time intensive the longer you work on the project, it seems. Yep. A project manager who has <coughs> read the mythical man month. Who, who hasn't read? Yeah, hasn't. <laughs> yes. Yes, we can we can put twenty people on this. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Yeah, we can speed this up twenty times by throwing twenty times as many people at it. Yep. The the software entropy, software rot is a very real thing. And the more changes you do, and we'll talk about when we get all the way to Robert Glass and he talks about maintenance. Maintenance is a critical issue. The primary operation, based on, on studies, the primary operation on maintenance is not fixing bugs, it's adding new features. Which means adding new codes, which means adding new paths that have to be tested and new opportunities for failure. Now, some of you have already said this. Why do you code? It's fun. You build things. You build things out of nothing. You're making things that are useful to other people. You make cool stuff happen on the screen. Uh, you're working, as he puts it, in a medium that's only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. And we'll, we'll talk later about why that's a major pitfall. <laughs> Uh, the <clears throat> why do you enjoy programming? I mean, you're you're all more or less you're all seniors, plus or minus a year. Why do you like programming, and why are you considering doing it for a living? Except for those of you who've decided now and do something else. Yes. Well, uh, I got into it when I was 14. Uh, started with C plus uh, plus, and. The moment I did Hello World, it was just so thrilling. The uh, rush that I got yeah. as the uh, terminal responded that I invested a lot of time into it and I started doing more and more complex things. And the rush always is the same, but it takes more to get it. And so it's, uh, <laughs> I just want to keep doing more and more. The first code is for me. <laughs> why else? All right, why, why do you like programs? What's most fascinating for you about it? Yes? 
so originally when I got into programming, the first coding I had done, I now that I know about it was back it, forever ago on Neopets using HTML. <laughs> and then I didn't actually get into real coding until taking 142. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing I enjoy about programming is just being able to make my ideas come to life. I think that's one of the coolest things and just realizing that you can have a real world impact in the things that you write. <coughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's an ancient, ancient cliche, but it's almost like magic. It's like learning spells. And I do this and do this, and I make these lights come on, and I have this 3D image here, and this sound comes out here. Uh, and then you completely change it around. Other other reasons. Yes? Well, building something that serves a purpose that helps someone's job be easier, faster. That's, that's actually always cool. It's like, hey, I've got this nifty application, now I can do this. I still do coding. Uh, I don't work on active projects, but uh, I had an expert witness case where I had all this customer data from two different sources, and the sets of data were in all different formats, and I had to figure out what overlap there was. Uh, and it was amazingly easy to use Python, and just with some trial and error, write a number of filters that would basically pull out what I needed to know from each side, and then do the comparisons for me. It was really cool. Yes? I was going to say, like, I've always liked understanding how things work, always. So I feel like by being able to create my own thing, I'm able to take, like, simple ideas and combine these simple ideas to create complex ideas. But I love being able to look at a complex idea and break it into simple parts, too. Software is the most complex thing done by a human. It is. The, the, the complexity of software is amazing. Now, it's one of the reasons why we have problems with software is because after a while, the complexity overwhelms us. We can't understand it. it you know, you start to have upper bounds to the actual quality of the system. Uh, and, and, and with all due respect, I will preface this by saying, uh, I have had two graduate classes in AI. If I continued for my graduate work, it would have been all focused on AI. I love AI, but I created a meme some months ago because it had become a new business buzzword. And it shows, it shows a programmer in front of a terminal that says, there is no true AI, it's just some coder's algorithms with bugs. <laughs> uh, and uh, which does not, I, 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 I am impressed beyond words with what Google has done. Uh, particularly with Go. Uh, when I took AI as an undergrad here, we had to write Go plain programs. So I had a special focus on that. And it's, it impresses the heck out of me. But a lot of what is touted as AI is really just algorithms. Like, yeah, I'll sort through this data, we'll do this, we'll do this. Any other, anyone else want to volunteer why they like coding? Like, um, oh, yes. I, I mean, I got my start in high school programming on the TI calculators, the TI basic. Yep. And I always found myself spending more time programming on there to do my math work than I could do my math. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's like, cool, I can do it this way. Yes. I just have a question. Do um, like the big uh, project <laughs> failures that you cited were like from governments? Is there like more of a tendency in government versus like the private sector to like? Have big projects fail, or is that just the biggest projects? Government tends to spend more on it. Uh, but the, the half billion dollar project I mentioned I came in to review was a private sector project. So yes, you can have the, the private sector has the advantage is that the plug eventually gets pulled sooner. Government projects can go on for much longer than they ever should have because no one has the authority to say, let's stop this and rethink it. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Okay, what are the problems of programming? <laughs> you have to perform perfectly. Other people set your objectives, your resources, and your information, often imperfectly. Often your authority is not sufficient for your responsibility. <coughs> we want you to do X. Well, this is how I'm going to do it. No, you can't do it that way. <laughs> I need this data. No, you can't have access to that data. <laughs> I need this many people to help me. No, you can't have those people. 
You often depend, and someone already mentioned this, you often depend on other people's programs which are less than perfect. And this is something I keep citing. The upper bound of quality of a complex system is determined by the lowest quality of any of its essential components. And it's, it's one of the reasons why the, folk, the, the, the tendency in complex systems for quality is almost always downward. Because it's bounded by the lowest quality of any essential subsystem. Designing grand concepts is fun. Finding little, little, nitty little bugs is just work. OK. <laughs> How many of you have started programming something? This is so cool, and it doesn't work quite right. And you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it. And it just takes forever to get it to work right. Yes? Yeah, that's happened. But sometimes it's fun to try to find those bugs. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> But if you're under a deadline, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, debugging has at best linear convergence. And, and he talks about this. He says you expect, oh, we're going to find a lot of bugs, and then we'll just get down to a few. And you expect the curve to look something like this. Instead, it looks like this, where it's trying to get those last number of bugs. It's just taking forever, which is why you start saying, I oh, will ship with them. What are other painful things you've discovered about programming? What are your least favorite parts about it? Or more, most frustrating parts? Anyone? You've all had wonderful experiences? Yes. A lot of clients don't understand what it is. <laughs> and so they think it's super easy. Yep. As you can see, inheriting like broken projects or like projects that have lots of issues. Yep. What else? Yeah. Yep. Getting team members. Yes. Uh, sometimes it takes away my desire to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've I've done. Again, I'm I'm old and gray now, but I have had two different startups where I, I literally have put in hundred hours a week, hundred hour weeks coding. Yes. Usually I have to work with people who don't have a sense of design. That can happen. Yes. Along those lines, working with, having to work with people that don't understand what they're doing when they're writing code, and then you look at their code. What are you? What? What? Yeah, that, that. I will. I will say this early. Uh, oh well. I'll, I'll see if it comes up. If it doesn't come up. We'll do it. Anyone else? I did one contribute things. Yes. Um, just as a side that isn't coming externally from a lot of these people do this or people do that. Sometimes just individually, it can be really hard to get started on something. Yep. Well, let's try and get your, your arms around it and figure out, OK, where do I even start? I, I, have, this, I have this big idea in my head. Yeah. I know how it's supposed to be. What's the first line of code I write to get there? Mm -hmm. and, and am I going down the wrong path? And we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about armor. Yes? Sometimes it can be hard to understand the problem you're trying to solve. Yes, it can. That's, that is actually a major issue, and often you end up solving the wrong problem. I'll throw one in here. Uh, the, uh, I did a computer game 30 odd years ago uh, for the Apple II called Sundog Frozen Legacy. While we were developing it, I had this great idea for this particular type of display on the screen, and spent probably two weeks coding it up and getting it all working, and I got it up on the screen and looked at it and said, no, that's just not it, uh, and threw it away. <laughs> and lost two weeks of work, and I was, you know, I was the main programmer. Uh, so, and, and this will get back to ARM, you often go down dead ends. Root cause is a project delays and failures. We have poor software estimation. This is, this is, we're going to cover this so many times. The inability to correctly estimate software projects is a root cause and a principal cause of most software failures. Yes? What's your rule of thumb? For software estimation? Yeah. Because like mine is like, like take, a, take my best guess, multiply by 10, and it's usually still not enough. That's, that's, there, there are a lot of rules of thumb like that for exactly that reason. I, I try to scope it in a bit more, but the problem, and, and Glass will talk about this, is that software estimation is usually done by the wrong people at the wrong time. 
the wrong people is it's usually managers who are doing the estimation, and the wrong time is you're doing it at the start of the project before you actually know what, what you're building. And it's kind of like, well, we're going to build this, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, we're going to do a spreadsheet. It's going to take us three months. It's like, what's that based on? Have you actually broken down everything that's going to take to build a spreadsheet and then what's going to be there? Uh, Number two, we're, we're back to the mythical man month. Our estimation techniques confuse effort with progress. It is possible to have people put a lot of time on a project and not make progress. You know, think about the failed projects I've talked about. Four years, $500 million, no code in production. Yet you had people working on it for four years. These were major, major consulting firms that this uh, corporation had brought in. Uh, because we're uncertain of our estimates, we lack the courage to say we don't know when we'll be done. We're going to talk a lot about this. It's the, you know, management above you says, when are you going to have this particular subsystem done? And you say, I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're still figuring out all the problems. That's not acceptable. When are you going to have this done? Give us a date. <laughs> three weeks. And three weeks from now, it's like, is it done? Well, no. <coughs> Why isn't it done? Well, I told you I wasn't sure. <laughs> This is a big issue. It will have a whole lecture on <coughs> metrics. It is very hard to assess how close, up, up in t unless you're very close to being finished, it's very hard to assess how much more time it's going to take to finish a particular component, a particular software project. And when the schedule slips, the impulse is to add people, which uh, Brooke says is like dousing a fire with gasoline. Why else? All programmers are optimists. Simple matter of coding. Oh, I can do that. I can see how to do that. And then you get insert programming and then you're back to uh, the I can't quite get my arms around it. You know, it's like, uh, I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, Adele Goldberg, uh, pioneer in object technology, says only optimists build complex systems. Everyone else is too scared to do it. Uh, it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I'll do this game. It'll be great. We'll show up on the favorite screen at the, the Apple Store. You know, uh, we'll do this and we'll do that. The <clears throat> I like this assessment. Probability that a given task will go well may be relatively high, but a meaningful software project comprises hundreds, if not thousands, of such tasks. This is put another way. Uh, yeah, I, Trying to think if this is Brooks or this is Glass. It is very, very easy to lose a day on your software project schedule. It's almost impossible to make it up. It is very much a one-way ratchet. And you, and you tend to carry in your mind, oh, well, you know, we're not on time. I'll, I'll work some extra this weekend. We'll get it done. Okay, individual project, yeah, you may be able to pull that off. But it's so easy in a project of any size to lose a day, a calendar day on the schedule, and it is almost impossible to say, oh, yeah, we just cut you know, a week off our entire schedule. <clears throat> Except by, and you're going to hear me say this is one, one of the things you'll probably quote in the midterm, you know what the magic success is to meeting your project schedule? <laughs> Not having a schedule. Throw away features. You throw away features. And, and I promise most of you on your projects will start out with what you think is, okay, this is what we're going to accomplish. And about halfway through the semester, you're going to be throwing features out left and right and saying, well, we'll just do this. Well, we'll just get this done. Oh, I actually had that as my next quote. Uh, this is an important one. We do the easy stuff first. One of the biggest problems in corporate and government IT is how easy it is to, to use tools, and these tools have been around for decades, to mock up a user interface. So it's like, yeah, here's a screen, here's windows, here's the menus, here's everything else, we can drag and drop, we can do this. And a manager looks at that and says, okay, so are you done? It's like, well, no, it's going to take three years to build the back end. They're like, are you nuts? I've, I've seen this all on screen, why is it going to take three years to build the back end? Well, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this, it's going to take this, and we've got this, and so on. Uh, 
we as programmers, because we want to keep to our schedule, will often defer, and we'll talk about this again at length later, we push off the hard problems. And we do all the easy stuff, we pick all the low hanging fruit, what happens is we get near the end of the project, and what we're left with are all the hard problems that we've sort of been pushing off. And not only do we suddenly, our progress suddenly slow down, but often solving one of those hard problems may block a solution to one of the other hard problems. <coughs> so suddenly you're in a situation where it's like, this is going to take a lot of time. And it, it leads to the uh, classic rule of thumb, the first 90% of the project takes 90% of the schedule, the last 10% takes the other 90% of the schedule. <laughs> uh, that, that isn't original with me, that's been around the industry for a long time, and it's exactly that phenomenon. It's why you'll hear projects, oh yeah, we're about 80% complete, which is just a meaningless statement, because until, until you can actually have a fully functional system, you don't know how complete you are. You don't know how much long it's going to be to get it in production. What are some other ways in which we tend to be optimistic as programmers? Any ideas? Yes. Sometimes we think that it works, like the code we wrote actually is done. If not, it, it probably will break somewhere and force with something. Yep, that's, a, that's actually a very good and very insightful thing is that uh, with, without sufficient testing, it's kind of like, oh yeah, it does this, and suddenly someone does something and the panel blows up. Yes? I think we often also see third party libraries and we think, oh, like that's going to do it for us. Oh yes, that's the, again, it's dependency on outside stuff and you, you suddenly find out one of the projects last semester was using a, uh, uh, an engine, a graphics engine for a game. And uh, they, they discovered, as I mentioned, they discovered that first there were problems with the performance and actually programming using the engine on two different platforms. And then they found it did do some of the things they were hoping to do. Yes? Oh, oh yeah, it was, I'm, I'm sure none of our tens of thousands of users is going to notice this one bug. Oh yeah, yeah. No, they, they, they will notice. They will notice quickly. Sundog, the game, we, we introduced it at the West Coast Computer Fair in uh, March of 1984, and I was just very proud of it. And by the time the, the uh, this, this was back in the early 80s, West Coast Computer Fair in San Francisco was the big personal computer fair. This personal computer market was still pretty small at that time. I had a notebook. I had 30 bugs logged by the time we went home, uh, which, which professionally was embarrassing. It's like, how can that happen? I didn't think that bug was there. OK, the man month, uh, the idea of, and, and this is, <coughs> This still happens. This happens when you say, you have someone say, well, let's double the programming staff and we can cut the development time in half. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work on several levels. Uh, first, it doesn't, I'll get to a second. It doesn't, uh, there is a natural inherent incompressibility to software development. Second, if you're adding people to a late project, you slow it down because you've added lines of communication and you've added ramp up time. There are occasions where, and, and Brooks' law is that adding more people lengthens, not shortens the schedule. There are occasions where you may need to add people, you may need specific expertise, you may need to replace someone, and so on and so forth, and take a hit. But this, the sad fact is that. Uh, <coughs> <clears throat> trying to trying to compress a project in any way by increasing staff almost never works. Hand your hand. Uh, right. Now stop and think. For for those of you who worked on software projects, what do you think the impact is when someone leaves? Yes. Well, if it's a smaller company, it can be huge because they have the knowledge of the code base and they understand a lot of things that you may not have even looked at. In the software industry, there's what's known as the truck factor, which is how many key people can get hit by a truck and still have the project go to completion. <laughs> uh, really great. And in some, in some projects, it's one. It's like there is that one key person who is holding all this in her or his head. 
uh, and they they don't look the they look the wrong way crossing the street and they're hit by a truck and suddenly the project dies as a result. Uh, we're we're going to talk more about personal turnover. <coughs> This is an important part, and this is so hard, people in industry do not want to believe this, but Brooks is right. Debugging takes about half of the total project schedule. Now, whether or not you plan for it, that's what happens. That's why you get a project that's supposed to be 12 months and it goes to 18 months. It's because that three months that you had you know, set aside for testing turns out to be nine months. The underestimation of the testing is, is why you have projects like, I worked on a software project, and I'll talk more about it. In fact, I have to watch myself. I asked Ty about things I could do better, and he, he said, you know, by the time I got to the end of the semester, we had heard all your stories three or four times. So I have to parcel them out a little more. Uh, but I had a project that was a full year, commercial project it was full year late in shipping most agonizing year of my professional life. I'd never, I'd never delivered anything late before that. But I'd never worked with that big a group of engineers or that big a, a project that was being created from scratch. Uh, and that experience is pretty much what set me on the path of focusing on project success and failure as a main professional interest. <coughs> but a lot of that was, an awful lot of that was testing. And testing and testing and finding bugs and again just as Brooke says the the speed at which you find and fix bugs is a lot slower uh, gutless estimating yeah that's true DeMarco uh, and Lister actually I think it may just be Tom DeMarco uh, has a book called why does software cost so much and his response is compared to what there's, there's sort of this mindset that software should be, you know, it's, it's a simple matter of coding. It, it should be easy, it should be fast, it should be cheap. We have all these tools, we have libraries, we have IDEs, you know, we have engines. Uh, and once you step beyond a certain level of complexity, it bogs down. And upper management often doesn't want to hear a realistic estimate. They say, how long is this going to take? You look at it and say, well, I can't tell you because I don't know enough. That's strike one against you. He says, but if you held a gun to my head, I'd say a year. And he say, we need it in three months. You say, no, it can't be done in three months. Oh, we need it in three months. Get started. You see how far along we are in three months. And then you get to a year and you finally ship. They say, why are we nine months late? Well, I told you at the start it was going to take a year. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, Slip deadlines, drop features. <coughs> You're going to read about this. I'm simply going to say that conceptual integrity is important. And some of the comments that were made pointed this out. Yes? What exactly do you mean by slip deadlines? You, you say it's going to take another six months. <laughs> In other words, you, you, you get to the point and say, ah, you know, we thought we were going to have it done by March. It's going to be August. Uh, and, and as we'll talk about later, Fred Brooks takes, says, take no small slips. If you have the opportunity to slip a deadline, pat it. <laughs> pat it, pat it. Because what you don't want to do, one of the reasons that year was so agonizing for me was that I was, I was chief architect, uh, chief technical officer, I was part of the senior staff, and I had to go back to the investors every month, and they would say, what's your new deadline, and why should we believe this any more than your last deadline? And I had no good answer for that, because we kept slipping. Uh, I would have been far better off if we'd simply said, let's delay it a year. They, they probably would have exploded, but I would have only said that once. Instead, it was more like every other month saying, oh, we're going to slip another two months. That doesn't do much for your professional credibility and, and doesn't do much for your sleep as well. Well, you might finish ahead of time. Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, like I said, it's, it's, you 
want to, as, as per your rule of thumb, you want to pad your estimates, you want to pad your slips because it probably will actually take that long. One of the biggest issues in, well, let me back up. Some of the best pieces of software that have ever been built are built typically by one to three people working very closely because it's very easy to develop and maintain a consistent design and fundamental set of concepts underlying it. Once you get beyond that, the question becomes how do you enforce a consistent, meaningful architecture? Well, you do it by having a chief architect who serves as a guardian over the architecture. Uh, a lot of organizations, it, when I go in to review a trouble project and corporation where they're like bringing me in to say, you know, figure out what's going wrong. One of the very first questions I ask is, who's the chief architect? Uh, I did this on one project and I got six different answers, one of which was nobody. And the other five were five different people. So it was very clear there was no chief architect. No concept of that. <clears throat> consistency of design, consistency of architecture is a major factor of project success. When you organize your teams, I will ask that someone be designated chief architect, and I will ask that someone be designated project manager, and they need to be two different people. Because I have spent time being both the project manager and the chief architect. Uh, for a significant project and it doesn't work. <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience. Yes? What's the res what are the responsibilities of the project manager? Project manager is to get the project done. Okay. Basically manage the people, manage the schedule, uh, manage all the deliverables, <coughs> uh, compare the requirements against the uh, actual product under development and so on. The responsibility of the chief architect is to ensure there is a solid, viable, sufficiently robust architecture underlying the product and defining the factors that everyone who's doing implementation will follow in actually implementing the project. <clears throat> the, uh, in the section of second system effect, this is an important one. Features that may seem simple to the customer may actually be very difficult to design and implement. Uh, this is part of the seductive nature of software. You know how easy it is to throw stuff up on the screen and prototype. It's like, yeah, it does this and this. That's so cool. You've got that, you know, got that 3D shape that's rotating and so on. And can you do this? And and you say, well, no, that's actually hard. And the, the person who may not be technical says, well, why? You're doing all this other stuff. Why is that hard? Well, it's because of this. Are you just making excuses? Do you just not want to do it? Are you lazy? It's like, no, it's actually hard. It can be difficult when you're dealing with non-technical people to explain to them why some things that you can do rapidly that look amazing or perform amazing are easy, and other things that may seem to them simple are actually very difficult. Uh, yes? Can you give us an example? Yeah, uh, at Pages. That's where I was chief technical officer. We're doing a desktop publishing system. <coughs> design oriented, use a design model so that you know you can change the design model. The document would lay itself out according to proper design principles, topography, relative ratio, so on and so forth. And we were well into development uh, and trying to get it finished. And the, the CEO said, can we put in rotating headlines? You know, so, so the user can just pick up the corner and rotate it. And, and I said, well, actually, no. I said, first, that sort of breaks the whole design model paradigm. But beyond that, the underlying architecture and so on is not set up to support that. This is what we did in Ventura. I said, I know, but this is something, if you wanted this as a feature, it would have been good to know about a year ago. And we could have done the underlying stuff to make it work. And he kept saying, why can't we just do rotating it? I said, Larry. I would have to go back and redo so much of the architecture and design. The, the, the document model, the uh, display model, everything else to add that in. Uh, <coughs> there is a tendency 
when you defer features in a 1.0 release is to try and put them all in the next release. Uh, it's a real temptation because you will have deferring features and the problem is with this is that you'll end up pushing far too much in there and causing problems. <coughs> There's also the issue of technical debt. How many of you have heard that term before? Basically it's the same thing. It's like we, we did this in a quick and dirty fashion to get it out the door, but we need to go back and fix that. And often you'll go back to management and they'll say, no, we don't have time to do that. We need to add these features. Like, no, no, we really need to go back and fix this. Uh, okay, assignments for next class is actually read these chapters, and I'll post this online. I'll send out an email and so on. Plus the uh, online essay, the five words of ignorance, this is for two weeks. Watch one podcast, and that's actually not due till a week from Saturday. Uh, post at least one project. Oh, there's actually that's supposed to have a line break there between GitHub and Vote. Post at least one idea, pro project idea, and as I said, yeah, we have 60 of us here. I'm not sure I want to deal with 60 of us. Uh, if you see a project idea and think, oh, that's cool, that's, that's as good as one I want. Uh, feel free to count that as your project idea. Uh, vote on at least three projects because what we're going to do in two weeks is we're going to actually do a vote down. We're going to throw out, we're just look at all the projects, throw out the ones that don't meet a certain threshold, revote, and keep doing this until we, we end up with projects so that every project has at least, say, five people on it. Uh, your billable hours one is going to be due. And podcast one, the readings, those are, I think, all due a week from Saturday on Learning Sweep. Uh, now, that's that. <coughs> but the idea was smart. Uh, yeah, that would be the thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.